Well, good morning. This is Barry O'Dell with the Church of Christ at Mammoth Spring Facebook page. It is Tuesday morning, February 27th, 2024. Hope everybody's doing all right today. We are in the book of Isaiah, and good to see people joining on. Of course, here and the nearchurches.com Facebook page. Ask your questions or comments if you have any. And of course, also YouTube. We'll upload this content to our YouTube channel and to our Podbean podcast channel after the live stream is over. Good morning, Connie. Good to see you. Gail, Sheila, and everybody else who's joining on. We're going to start off in Isaiah chapter 7 today and try to cover chapter 7 through 9. These are very prophetic chapters, particularly in connection with the Messiah. So I'm going to try to cover this as one unit and so, hopefully you're ready to go. Still got more folks joining on here in just a second. Well, we did chapters 4, 5, and 6 yesterday, so maybe we can do 7, 8, and 9 today. And really, so I've got it up on the screen here if you're looking at the screen. You have the commission of Isaiah here in chapter 6 as we looked at yesterday, and Isaiah, at the end of that chapter, asked how long he was supposed to keep doing his prophetic work. And you'll remember God's answer was, until the cities are laid waste and without inhabitant, until the house is without a man, the land is utterly desolate. That's coming for them in the future. But the end of chapter 6 says, but yet a tenth will be in it. There's going to be a holy seed shall be its stump. Israel is pictured as a tree that's cut down, the stump is left behind, but there's going to be something that shoots up out of that stump in the future. That's where chapter 7 picks up. Good morning. Michelle, good to see you. So it's important to make that connection from chapter 6 and verse 13 into chapter 7 because in chapter 7, Isaiah is going to be dealing with King Ahaz, king of, well, as it says here, chapter 7 and verse 1, came to pass in the days of Ahaz, the son of Jotham, the son of Uzziah, the king of Judah. All right, so again, we've covered the dates. We're looking at this period of time, 740 to 720 B.C., approximately. Well, at this period of time, southern Israel is under attack from the king of Syria, a man by the name of Reason, and Pekah, the king of Israel. They went up to Jerusalem to make war against it, but could not prevail against it. So chapter 7 is written in that historical context. And God tells the prophet here, I want you to go talk to Ahaz. Take your son with you. I'll tell you where to meet him. And uh, don't worry about what, you know, don't worry about the, the threats that are coming up at you from Israel and from Syria. All right, these things that they are planning, they're not going to come to pass. In fact, in Isaiah chapter 7 and verse 4, when, well, the message that Isaiah is told to give to King Ahaz is, Take heed and be quiet, do not fear or be faint-hearted, for these two stubs of smoking firebrands. Okay, <laughs> stubs of smoking firebrands. They're smoke blowers, essentially. They're big talkers. Their plans to attack Judah, again, Syria and Israel, their plans to attack Judah, it's not going to work out. Well, here's what they've been saying. Verse 6, Let us go up against Judah and trouble it. Let us make a gap in its wall for ourselves and set a king over them, the son of Tabal. Well, again, God says, no, it's not going to happen. Isaiah chapter 7, verses 7 through 9. So again, it's when we study particularly the Old Testament prophets. Hey, good morning. Let's see here. Anna and Susan, good to see you guys. It's always important when we're studying these Old Testament prophets to have some frame of reference in regard to their historical context, when this is going on, what's going on. That's why if you're going to have a good grasp of your Old Testament, it's very important to know the books of Samuel, Kings, and Chronicles, those books of history. And I know that's a lot of content. Those are long books, and there is a lot of history. But if you really want to understand the prophets, you need to know that period of time. You need to know the rulers. Because not only do you have the, the kings of God's people, Israel and Judah, but you also have all these external forces like Syria, 
and like Assyria and Babylon. And Samuel, Kings, and Chronicles really pulls all that together for us, especially when we start reading the prophets. So, I don't know, just a bit of advice there, you might say. Good morning, Lyle. Good morning, Brian. Good to see you guys. All right, so Israel and Syria's plans to attack Judah and Jerusalem, not going to happen. Uh, they, well, within 65 years, Ephraim will be broken. Ephraim is a reference. It's another term for northern Israel, so that it will not be a people. The head of Ephraim is Samaria, and the head of Samaria is Remaliah's son, Pekah king of Israel. If you will not believe, now this is the message to Ahaz, and this is where it gets interesting. If you will not believe what God is telling King Ahaz through the prophet Isaiah, then you will not be established. All right, so southern Israel, Judah is worried about what's going to happen. God warns him, I'm not going to let this happen, but if you don't believe me, well, you're going to have your own problems. So, verse 10, moreover, the Lord spoke again to Ahaz, saying, Ask for a sign for yourself from the Lord your God. Ask it either in the depth or in the height above. Now, that's an interesting challenge because, you know, you think of passages like, well, so many instances in the Gospels where people come to Jesus and they say, well, give us a sign. What is it? Matthew chapter 16. Let me turn over here real quick. I think I find, I think I can just give you a good example of this, what's going on here. Yeah, Matthew chapter 16. So, At the end of Matthew chapter 15, Jesus is healing people. He feeds the multitudes. Matthew, let's see, Matthew 15, beginning in verse 32, he feeds the 4,000. So all of these signs are being performed to, to prove, as they do, miracles, to prove that Jesus is the Son of God. Well, then chapter Matthew 16, verse 1 says, Then the Pharisees and Sadducees came and testing him, asking them that he would show a sign from heaven. Well, he's already been showing all these signs, and the, the phrase there in the Greek literally means they wanted a sign that would come out of the heavens. They've seen stuff he's been doing here, but, you know, we want something better than that. Well, his, his response to that is, a wicked, this is Matthew 16, 4, a wicked and adulterous generation seeks after a sign, and no sign shall be given it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. It's a reference to the resurrection. I've been performing all these signs. All the evidence is here that I'm the Messiah. You want another sign? You'll get it when I'm raised from the dead. Here in Isaiah, God says to somebody, you ask for any sign, either in the depth, the deepest part of the ocean maybe, or from the height above. Because the, And the reason he does this is because he's just told Ahaz through Isaiah, what Syria and Israel is planning to do to you is not going to come to pass. Now, if you don't believe me, you will not be established. You're going to have your own problems. So here's what I want you to do, Ahaz. Ahaz, ask for a sign, and I'll give it to you. But Ahaz said, I will not ask, nor will I test the Lord. Now that sounds very... Okay, so think about what Jesus said in response to Satan's temptations. Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. On its surface, what Isaiah, what Ahaz says here in chapter 7 and verse 12 sounds good, but he's wrong. He's not testing the Lord here. God has said himself, ask for a sign and I'll give it to you to prove that what has just been told to you in verses, as we have it, verses 7 through 9, is going to happen. What we need to understand, and this this goes back to what I was saying just a minute ago, that we need to have a good grasp of Kings and Chronicles because when you take your Bible back to those passages, like if you're reading the historical accounts in the books of Kings and Chronicles, you go to 2 Kings chapter 16, and what Ahaz is doing behind the scenes to protect himself from Israel and Syria is he's trying to make an alliance with Tig- Tiglath-Pileser, the king of Assyria. But when God says, I'll protect you and ask for a sign to prove it, he says, no, I don't want to test you. So what Ahaz does here is a complete lack of faith. And that's exactly what the warning was in Isaiah 7, 9. If you don't believe me, you will not be established. Well, he didn't believe God. That's why, number one, he was seeking an alliance with Assyria and Tiglath-Pileser III. And that's why, number two, he makes this virtue signal here. No, no, I'm not going to test the Lord. Well, when God tells you to do something, I think you'd better do it. So then you have this pronouncement, Isaiah 7:13. Hear now, O house of David. Notice the shift here. 
So the conversation goes from to Ahaz, ask a sign, Ahaz's response. Now the conversation shifts to the house of David. All right, this is the nation at large. The king himself has refused a sign. The whole nation is afraid, and we'll see that as we go throughout the text, because of the threats coming from northern Israel and, and the uh, Syrians. The whole house of Judah is going to suffer, the whole house of David. Is it a small thing for you to weary men, but will you weary my God also? You, you know, Ahaz, do you think God doesn't know that you're seeking an alliance with Assyria while all this is going on, and yet you refuse to do what he asks you to do? Here's a sign for the house of David that's going to come in the future. The Lord himself shall give you a sign. So you, so you won't ask for one? All right, I'll give you one. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. Now, from understanding the totality of Scripture, we, of course, connect this with Matthew chapter 1 and the birth of Jesus. Uh, the, the virgin birth, as it says here in verse 14, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son. You're going to call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted, of course, is God with us. So, you have this going on here. For some reason, my Bible app is not responding. Let me open it back up to Isaiah chapter 7. All right, here we go. So the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and thou shalt call, or you shall call his name Emmanuel. That's Matthew 1, verses 18 to 25. The angel communicating with Joseph about what's going on with Mary. Okay. You didn't ask. You didn't do what God said do. Here are going to be the consequences of that. Now, this idea of the virgin birth, this is a significant prophecy. And like I said, we've already looked at chapter 2 was prophesy, uh, prophetic. Chapter 4 and verse 2 is prophetic of the branch. Now you have this very specific reference to the virgin birth of Christ. And it being provided as a sign, remember from verse 13, to the house of David. It's a reference to the tribe of Judah. All right, from which tribe Jesus descended, according to Hebrews chapter 7 and verse 14. God's going to give you a sign. Curds and honey he shall eat, that he may know to refuse the evil and choose the good. For before the child shall know to refuse the evil and choose the good, the land that you dread will be forsaken by both her kings, Israel and Syria. Things are going to change rather quickly, and Ahaz is going to see that happen. Now, obviously, Ahaz is not going to see the birth of Emmanuel, but that's the sign that's coming to the house of David at large. Verse 17, the Lord will bring the king of Assyria upon you and upon your people and your father's house. Days that have not come since the day that Ephraim departed from Judah. So what then begins to happen through the rest of Isaiah chapter 7 is this pronouncement of judgment. The, the, the Assyrians, because of Ahaz's lack of faith and because of his attempting an alliance with the Assyrians, I'm trying to pronounce that clearly, so there's a difference between the Syrians and the Assyrians. Well, there's going to there's gonna be, a, as the text says here, a hired razor. The idea is Judah's going to be raised, R-A-Z-E-D, shaved, if you will, shaved to the ground by the Assyrians. And the, we're not going to read all of these verses, but the rest of chapter 7 lays out the consequences of the Assyrian attack on Judah and Jerusalem. And of course, ultimately, we, again, we think of Babylon coming in in 600 to 580 B.C. and completely destroying Jerusalem and Judah. Chapter 8 continues the same message. Again, there's not a lot to add to it. Chapter 8 continues. Deborah says it is sad that the innocent have to suffer right along with the guilty. Well, that's the nature of things, though, isn't it? And we, and we see that repeatedly throughout the, New Test, uh, throughout the Old Testament with the nations of Israel and Judah. And, well, even, you know, I think of even Jonah's prophetic work. The Ninevites were threatened with, this, with destruction, and there was, what's, what's the text say, 120,000 who didn't know the difference between the right hand and the left? Yeah, sometimes the innocent, the innocent suffer because of the wickedness of others. And, well, that was going to happen to God's people too here. So the, so chapter 8 continues this particular discussion. You see here the, the heading, 
Assyria will invade the land. But there's more instruction. Isaiah already has one son. We know that he's married. He's got one son by the name of Shir Jashub. Now chapter 8 says this, Moreover the Lord said to me, Take a large scroll and write on it with a man's pen concerning Mahir Shalal Hashbaz. Isaiah's going to have a second son. And this is his name. Now that's, for us English-speaking folk, that is a weird name. Mahir Shalal Hashbaz. And the meaning of that is, speed the spoil, the text here, or this, this particular dictionary says, hasten the booty, the, the, the ruins, the, the rewards of war. And I will take for myself faithful witness to, rec to record, Uriah the priest and Zechariah the son of Jeberechiah. Then I went to the prophetess, and she conceived and bore a son. Then the Lord said to me, call his name Mahir Shalal Hashbaz. So this is very similar to what happens basically with Hosea and Gomer. Each of those children of that union had a name that meant something that was applied to the, to the events and th such of Israel. That's exactly what's happening here. Now this is their son, but his name means something prophetic for the people. For before the child shall have knowledge to cry, My father and my mother, the riches of Damascus and the spoil of Samaria will be taken away before the king of Assyria. Now that, of course, happens in about 722 B.C. You can read about that in 2 Kings chapter 17, which incidentally, the time frame of Isaiah's work, those kings that he's listed, you've got Pekah and you've got Reason. That's in 2 Kings chapters 15 and 16, and 2 Kings chapter 17 records what's written here in Isaiah chapter 8 and verse 4, that Syria and northern Israel is going to be taken by the Assyrians. Again, a lot of chapter 8 covers the king of Assyria and all his glory, the, the punishment that he's going to bring, the, the captivity that's going to occur. And that goes down through verse 10. Look at this, Isaiah chapter 8 and verse 9. Be shattered, O you people, and be broken in pieces. Give ear, all you from far countries. Gird yourselves, but be broken in pieces. So, you know, you can get ready, but the threat from Assyria is real, and it's going to happen. Take counsel together, but it will come to nothing. Speak the word, but it will not stand, for God is with us. The, the, the lack of a king's faith back in chapter 7, refusing to do what God told him to do, has led to what's getting ready to come. Now, beginning in Isaiah chapter 8 and verse 11, Isaiah and God begin to have a conversation. The Lord spoke thus to me with a strong hand, and instructed me that I should not walk in the way of this people. Don't act like the country around you, like, like your fellow citizens, let's say. Do not say a conspiracy concerning all that this people call a conspiracy, nor be afraid of their threats, nor be troubled. They want, the, the people want Isaiah to shut up. Okay, Jeremiah had to deal with this 150 years later. The people who are steeped in sin and are okay with the things, the way things are going, they want the messengers of God to keep their mouth shut. They don't want to hear this. Lord of hosts, him shall you hallow. This is, again, God speaking directly to the prophet Isaiah. Let him be your fear. Don't be afraid of the people. Let him be your dread. He will be as a sanctuary to Isaiah, but a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense to both the houses of Israel and as a trap and a snare to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. Well, they... They're living in a complete lack of faith, not doing what God would say. So what is Isaiah supposed to do? Bind up the testimony, seal the law among my disciples, and I will wait on the Lord who hides his face from the house of Jacob. I will hope in him. This is what Isaiah is, Isaiah is telling us what he's going to do. When all of the trouble comes around, he's going to place his faith in God. When they say to you, seek those who are mediums and wizards, who whisper and mutter. Okay, you know, Isaiah, if you can communicate with the dead, if you can communicate with someone better or greater than yourself, why don't you do that? Well, if they try that, should not a people seek after their God? Should they seek the dead on behalf of the living? That brings to my mind Saul when he's pursuing David and he calls up Samuel. I can't remember what chapter that's in, but the uh, the medium at Endor, 
Well, that's the advice of the people to Isaiah. But here's the response. To the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. That's a strong passage right there in terms of the, uh, the truth of God's word as opposed to some, some other source of knowledge, some other source of information. If people who claim to be God's word are satisfied with things other, how did I say, I said that wrong. If people who claim to be God's people depend on messages other than God's word, then they're not really God's people. Isaiah 8.20 is an important verse to, to keep in mind in that regard. So just for instance, I've been reading a couple of books. I have a friend who wrote a review on a book that was written recently, so I thought I'd read the book for myself, and I ended up ordering two, and they were both written by an individual who claims to be a member of the church, and one's about searching for the pattern of biblical authority, and one's about women's roles in the church. And it's just, his his reasoning is terrible. Uh, he has a lack of, I'll, I'll just say it, I mean, I've, I've read the books. He doesn't believe what Scripture says, but he paints it as if he does. And he frequently appeals to the authority of men and contemporaries. And it's hard to read the books because it's so. I know where the the I know where his thinking is going. I know the conclusion that that he's going to reach. But in the book, I get to see his process of how he got there. This is the standard right here. To the law and to the testimony, if they do not speak according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. Period. A serious coming. Nothing you can do about it. That's where chapter 8 ends, essentially. And, and again, you, here's the connection. And I've told you so many times, and you probably get sick of hearing it. They will look to the earth and see trouble and darkness and gloom of anguish, and they will be driven into darkness. There is no break here from chapter 8 to 9. Nevertheless, the gloom will not be upon her who is distressed. So this darkness that's coming from Assyria, the suffering that, that as Deborah said, even the innocent are going to have to endure, it's not going to last forever. Now we get prophetic again. The gloom will not be upon her who is distressed. As when at first her, he, lightly, he lightly esteemed the land, of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, those are northern tribes in Israel. These were the first, this would be the first part of the tribes that would be attacked by the Assyrians. They're coming out of the north and working their way south. So the land of Zebulun and Naphtali, and afterward more heavily oppressed her by the way of sea beyond the Jordan into Galilee of the Gentiles. The people who walked in darkness, that would be a reference, that the people of Isaiah's day would know what that was talking about, the darkness of Assyria the darkness of war and captivity and death. The people who have walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwell in the land of the shadow of death, upon them a light has shined. Well, let me just show you this real quick. What is this talking about? We are going to take our Bibles real quick to Matthew chapter 4 and begin in verse 12. Now when Jesus heard that John had been put in prison, he departed to Galilee. And leaving Nazareth, Galilee's up north, remember, he came and dwelt in Capernaum, which is by the sea in the regions of Zebulun and Naphtali, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet. The land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, by the way of, sea of, by the, way of the sea beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. The people who sat in darkness have seen a great light. And upon those who sat in the region of the shadow of death, light has dawned. From that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now we know what Isaiah chapter 9, verses 1 and 2 is referring to. This region of darkness, the northern tribes of Israel, they're going to be attacked, they're, again, in darkness and gloom and despair because of Assyria, but it's not going to last forever because the Son of Man is coming and the kingdom of heaven will be at hand. There's hope. There's light at the end of the tunnel, let's say. That's what Isaiah chapter 9 is about. Now, as you keep reading this chapter, there are other things. Uh, well, like, for instance, here in uh, verse 2 of Isaiah chapter 9, they've seen a great light. John chapter 8 and verse 12, Jesus says of himself, I am the light of the world. Uh, Isaiah, what is it? John chapter 1 and verse 
Uh, I can't think of the verse. Well, maybe it's verse 4, John 1, 4. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. That's what Isaiah chapter 9 is talking about. It's messianic. So anyway, you keep reading Isaiah chapter 9. The Gentiles would be welcomed in. So Isaiah's dealing with his people, with Judah and Jerusalem. But notice, you have increased or multiplied the nation and increased joy. And Isaiah does this so often throughout his book. He talks about these prophecies in regard to the, the kingdom and the Messiah, and he includes the nations. He includes the Gentiles specifically. And, of course, we see that fulfilled in the, in the church and the kingdom of Christ. They rejoice before you according to the joy of harvest, as men rejoice when they divide the spoil. Okay? How's all this going to happen? For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Well, again, we know exactly who that's talking about. That is prophetic of Jesus. So look at a couple of these words here, or descriptors, let's say, of the Messiah, who's going to be coming. He's going to be referred to as Mighty God. Well, if you make notes in the margin of your Bible, you might write next to that phrase, Colossians 2.9. It says, In Him was the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Jesus is the Mighty God. It, it, that doesn't make Him the Father. Yeah, but the verse says, Well, He is the Everlasting Father. Well, what does that mean? I thought... <laughs> I thought there was God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Well, as you're thinking about this, a couple of verses I have us to, to think about. I wrote them down here. Okay. John chapter 5. I'm going to turn over to this page real quick, or this chapter real quick, and show you what does it mean where this son who's going to be born is called the everlasting father. There is this idea that some people have that, well, it's called the oneness doctrine. That, that Jesus is a is God and just a different manifestation, that there's only one in the Godhead, and that they just man, he just manifests himself differently. John 5, 16, For this reason the Jews persecuted Jesus and sought to kill him, because he had done these things on the Sabbath. But Jesus answered them, My Father has been working until now, and I have been working. Notice those are two different individuals. My Father's been working, I have been working. And here's the Jewish response to what he says. Therefore, the Jews sought all the more to kill him because he not only broke the Sabbath, but also said that God was his father, making himself equal with God. The Jewish frame of reference, that, that's, what they, that's how they took that. When Jesus claimed to be the son of God, that God was his father, their mind went to, well, he's making... <coughs> He's making himself equal with God. And he, he continues on in that text talking about the work that the Father's done and the work that he's done and that all of that testifies that he is the Son of God. So when we see this phrase here in Isaiah 9, 6, don't be perplexed about that. Just understand how that was used. Jesus is not the Father, but he's equal with the Father. That's why he's the mighty God. Jesus possesses the fullness of the Godhead. Of the increase of his government, there will be no peace. I'm sorry. Well, that was wrong. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. And upon the throne of David and over his kingdom, to, us, to order it and establish it with judgment and justice. A serious coming. It's dark. It's gloomy. Punishment, suffering. But light's coming. This is an important phrase here. Upon the throne of David and over his kingdom. Well, from no, notice this. When is Jesus going to be upon the throne of David and over his kingdom from that time forward and forever? All right, let's make a New Testament connection here. It's always, I think it's always important to do that with these messianic promises. Luke chapter 1, the angel speaking to Mary, verse 31. Behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and be called the son of the highest. Okay, everlasting father, mighty God. Here you go. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David. That's Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 7. He will reign over the house of Jacob, and, over his ki and of his kingdom there will be no end. So all of this in Isaiah chapter 9, beginning in verse 1, 
down through verse 7 is prophetic of Jesus Christ, of his kingship, of his royalty, being a seed of David. Romans 1.3 says that. He's of the seed of David according to the flesh. But he was declared to be the Son of God with power by the resurrection from the dead. Isaiah 9, 1 through 7 is extremely important to understand, and it's, it's really going to be connected to something we're going to look at in Isaiah chapter 11, where it's talking about the nature of the kingdom. All right, so he's going to be king. There's no question about that. He's going to be upon the throne of David, and he's going to order it and establish it with judgment and justice. And God's going to, well, as it says here, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. That's a guarantee that this is going to happen. And remember, Isaiah's prophesying, we'll just round it, 700 years before the Christ is born. And he's being so specific. And we see all of these prophecies fulfilled in Matthew 1 and in Luke chapter 1 and so on. What you now have through the rest of chapter 9 is this right here. The Lord sent a word against Jacob, and it has fallen on Israel. So it, you go from a prophecy of death and captivity and darkness to light and hope, and then back to modern day, what Isaiah was dealing with in his day. So the rest of chapter 9 does that, and there's this repeated phrase three or four times in the rest of the chapter. Here it is, Isaiah 9, 12. For all this, his anger is not turned away, but his hand is still stretched out. Bad times are coming, but the wrath of God is still going to be satisfied. Why is that? Well, the people do not turn to him who strikes them, nor do they, nor do they seek the Lord of hosts. Remember back in chapter 7, Ahaz, God says, ask for a sign from below or above, and I'll give it to you. And he says, no, I'm not going to do that. And the reason he wouldn't do that, the reason Ahaz wouldn't do that, was because he was already working on a political alliance with Assyria. So for all this, because of everything that's been happening, God's anger is not turned away, and his hand is still stretched out. It's going to affect everybody. Um, the prophet who teaches lies, he's the tail, the leader of this people, everybody is going to suffer. And for all this, his anger is not turned away, but his hand is still stretched out. Again, God is still coming in judgment. Wickedness burns as the fire. It devours the briars and thorns. Through the wrath of the Lord of hosts, the land is burned up. And for all of this, his anger is not turned away, but his hand is stretched out still. So this is going to be severe. This is going to be severe. But it, it, it goes from the top down, from, from the faithlessness of Ahaz all the way down through the people. This is the wrath of God being manifest through the Assyrians, and it's going to, well, it's not going to be good, that's for sure. All right, I think we'll stop there today and start in chapter 10 tomorrow. Chapter 10 continues the, well, as it says here, the decree. <laughs> woe to those who decree unrighteous decrees. Now, Isaiah's already had several woes. Chapter 10 is going to continue that. But then you also have a woe to Assyria. So we'll talk about that too, because Assyria is called the rod of my anger. God uses the nations to accomplish his purpose. So we'll talk about that tomorrow. We'll get into chapter 11. I'm just scrolling on through here. Chapter 11 is quite an interesting chapter that needs to be understood. So we'll deal with it tomorrow. All right, guys, thank you for being here today. Hey, Susan, thank you. Appreciate it. Hope everybody has a good day and hope you come back tomorrow at 11 and we'll study more from Isaiah.